Hey, we're going to jump into the Word. We've been on a new series over the last couple Sundays called The Redemptive Community. The Redemptive Community. And this is week number three. Uh, once again, I can't, of course, um, circle back to all what we've talked about. You can join online, YouTube, podcasts, whatever, catch up with us. But essentially what we're talking about over these five, six weeks that we'll spend on this series is what does it mean for you and I to be part of a community? Not just any community, but this community, uh, a church community, a family what does that mean? And the first week we talked about that we are people of community, not just services. I want you to know if you're new to our church or maybe you've been here the last few weeks, these rooms getting bigger and bigger are not our goal, by the way. Us having more people in a room or more services, we're not here to have bigger gatherings. We're here to have deeper family, deeper relationship, more connection. Uh, you walking in this room, sitting in a pew and going home and be like, cool, I went to church. That's not a win for us. That's not a check off the box. Cool, we went to a room and sat in a pew and listened to a word and went home. That's not a win. That's not church. It's life on life, heart on heart, relationships together. So week one, we talked about we're people of community, deeply, radically committed to each other. Last week, we talked about we're people of confession. We're here to confess our sins and tell one, one another what's going on and not hide our shadows and hide the other sides of us. We're here to like really, really, really do life and honesty together. We talked about confession all last week, what confession does to the human heart. Once again, you can join with us. Um, uh, listen last week if you missed it. But today, we're going to continue part three in our redemptive community. We're going to read out of the book of John, uh, sorry, book of Luke today. Book of Luke chapter five. Luke chapter five, four verses. Mainly just one though. The very last verse we're going to hone in on today. But Luke chapter five. An LT version says, In one of the villages, Jesus met a man with an advanced case of leprosy. When the man saw Jesus, he bowed with his face to the ground, begging to be healed. Lord, he said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Different sermon for a different time, but I thought it was fascinating that this man had more confidence in God's power than God's motive. He was like, I know you can do it, I just don't know if you're willing. And Jesus reached out and touched the man. Oh, I am willing, he said. Be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared, and Jesus instructed him not to tell anyone what had happened. He said, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. For this will be a public testimony that you've been cleansed. Verse 15 says, but despite Jesus' instructions, the report of his power spread even faster. And hear this last sentence, and vast crowds came to hear him preach. Vast crowds gathered around him to preach and to be healed of their diseases. Verse 16, we're in a Q-in on this sentence. But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. If you're reading the NIV or ESV, it's not the word wilderness, it's the word lonely places, but it's the same Greek word, eremos. It's the same word, it means wilderness, hidden places, lonely places, desert places, desert, uh, uh, wilderness areas. So it's all the same word. This one says he withdrew to the wilderness or to lonely places to pray. Let's pray as we jump into Luke chapter five together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you every single person on the side of my voice. Father, whether it's their first time ever in church in their entire life, and this is a new space and place for them, or maybe those that are back in church today after a decade of being gone, and those that come every single week, Father, would you open our eyes, open our ears to hear you more clearly? Open this word to us, God, as we talk about Luke chapter 5 and Jesus withdrawing. God, I pray that you would illuminate it, open it. God, we're here not to play church. We're here to be changed. We're here to be changed from the inside out. And Father, we thank you. Thank you. Thank you for today. In your mighty, mighty name, I pray. And everyone said... There was a, a study done recently, um, about uh, 10 years ago, and it was from the leading psychiatrist and counselor at the University of Virginia, the Uni University of Virginia, and he had this question. He um, began, through all of his counseling and all of his psychiatry and all of his stuff, he began to understand and notice in all of his counseling that people are becoming allergic to silence, don't like silence. And so he wanted to do a survey. He wanted to do an experiment. So he got 11 different groups, 11 different studies with people ranging from 17 to 77. Different races, backgrounds, social political groups, like not the same group of people. 11 different rooms, 11 different studies with people. And this was the study. Each person had to walk into a room and the room was like a white padded wall, like a, a, just a room and a chair. That's it. And this is what the study was. He would ask all the people in 11 different studies, 11 different rooms, he would give them this option. You can go in this room, sit in this chair for 15 minutes of silence. No phones, nothing but you 
and a chair and a white padded wall room for 15 minutes. Or if you would rather not do that, you can, um, you can choose to be shocked with a high electric current for three seconds. Three seconds. You can be shocked, not like a little kid's play toy, like shocked, or sit in silence for 15 minutes. 67% chose to be shocked. 67% said, nah, I'm not sitting in that room in silence. I'd rather be shocked. And another realm of people chose to sit in silence, but within six minutes chose to be shocked to get out. And he goes on to say this at the end of the article that I was reading about this um, psychological understanding that we're allergic to silence, essentially. He says this. He says, it was shocking to me. Most people prefer to be doing something rather than nothing, even if that something is hurting themselves. The article ends this way. He says, it was shocking that people would rather hurt themselves than talk to themselves. Sixty-seven percent. I'd rather not sit in a room and talk to myself. I'd rather be shocked for three seconds. I can go home. Why? Because we, you and I, had this little thing in your hand, this little thing in your front or back pocket called a phone. And this little device, and I think the year two thousand six or seven, whenever it was made, changed everything. The end of the article goes on and links some other articles that now, it, if you go to a psychiatrist or counselor, like, there's now a new phobia that has been deemed medically accredited at this point uh, about a couple years ago, and it's called, we on the screen, it's called nomophobia. No mobile phobia. It's a real phobia that people have, the fear of losing their phone. You can be diagnosed with nomophobia. Fear of losing your phone. Or, in some cases, a deeper realm, it's the fear of being disconnected from your virtual reality. And they have found, psychologically, that some people have created such a fake world on their phone that is not them in real life at all. They don't know what to do with themselves when they lose their virtual reality. And they would say, it's like an addict looking for the next hit. They, I, need my, I need my phone. I, I, have to, I have to look at the comments. I have to look at the phones. Like, because we've created such an alter reality, a virtual reality, that now people can be diagnosed with, you have nomophobia. You can't live without your phone. Which is a whole other issue today that we are not going to talk about, our phones and addiction they're in. But recent studies show that the average American will check their phone 352 times a day. That you'll pick your phone up and check. 352 times a day. The average millennial spends seven and a half hours a day on their phone. Not for work, like, oh, I'm on socials, I work. No, like, just on your phone. Boomers are about four and a half hours and Gen Z is about eight. We are addicted to our phone. I would like to submit today, of course, my psychological addition to this conversation, is I don't really think we're addicted to our phone, we're just scared of ourselves. Ronald Ronheiser says this, we are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. It is not that we have anything against God, depth, and spirit, we like all these things. It is just that we are habitually too preoccupied to have any of these things show up on our radar screens. This is amazing. We are more busy than we are bad. More distracted than non-spiritual. Pathological busyness, distraction, and restlessness are major blocks today within our spiritual lives. The great Dutch theologian Henry Nouwen says this. We panic when there is nothing and nobody left to distract us. When we have no project to finish, no friend to visit, no book to read, no television to watch, no record to play, and when we are left all alone by ourselves, we are brought so close to the revelation of our basic human aloneness. And we are so afraid of experiencing an all-pervasive sense of loneliness that we will do anything to get busy again and continue the game which makes us all believe that everything is fine after all. We've talked about that we're people of community. 
We've talked about where people have confession. Today, I want to talk about what would it look like to be a community of contemplation. A community of contemplation. Or other writers and other theologians and scholars use the word silence and solitude. Contemplation, devotion, withdrawal, devotions, daily disciplines, many other terms. But the reality is that we are called to be people of solitude. I want you to think about this. What if we became a community of solitude? Now, some of you are like, how do those two words go in the same sentence? A community of solitude? Yeah, what would it mean, and I like the word contemplation more than solitude, but what, what would it mean for you and I not just to be a people of community, but a people of contemplation? Because this is the reality. Many of us are prone to one or the other. We're prone to community, we're prone to people, we're prone to parties, we're prone to gatherings, or we're prone to isolation, we're prone to solitude, we're prone to being alone. We, we want to choose our personality, our Myers-Briggs, or whatever, or we choose one end or the other, but this is the reality. Not one of us in this room, if we're a follower of Jesus, are called to choose one. We are called to be both. We are called to be people of community and people of solitude. Hear me, those two things are not enemies of each other, they're gifts to each other. I, a, a solitude is not an enemy of community. Community is not an enemy to solitude. They are gifts to one another. And we are actually called to be both people. Why? Because Jesus was both. Basic Christianity 101, what's our goal here? To become like Jesus. 101, right? So if that's our goal, to become like Jesus, we must watch his pattern and rhythm of life. And one thing you pick up very quickly in the New Testament is Jesus was a person of the crowds and a person that withdrew. Luke chapter 5 verse 16 says, and Jesus withdrew often. There's no less than 10 stories. Maybe more if you think some of the stories are different stories, they're not the same. No less than 10 of Jesus going to a massive crowd and not a crowd like 20 people, like Tens of thousands, like a crowd, healing, praying, healing, freedom, demo demoniacs, healing people, and then he would draw. And then he'd leave withdraw and go to his disciples. And then he'd be with his disciples, cross the river, and he'd go to the mountain. He'd come back to the crowd and heal people, and he'd escape. The Bible says he would do this often. He was a man of solitude and a man of community. And so for you and I to follow Jesus, we don't get to choose one of the options because our personality leans more that way we're called to be people of both people of community crowds gatherings and people of contemplation now maybe some of you and maybe some of you that are younger in the room like this sounds like a bunch of stuff on tiktok like what's the difference i'm told all the time to have quietness and centering and real quick you must you must know this by now that the world is simply hijacking god's stuff renaming it and claiming it is new that's all they're doing. Sounds like this. Uh, we believe in mindfulness. It's called prayer. <laughs> We've been doing this for a while. Fine, just center yourself. Have some mindfulness. It's called meditation and prayer. We've been doing this for a couple thousand years. Uh, it sounds like, what are your rules for life? How do you habit stack? <laughs> Let's find some rules for life. It's called the book of Proverbs. It's called wisdom. This isn't new. Habit stacking is called the fear of the Lord. Like, where's, the world is simply hijacking God's stuff and just leaving God out of it. It sounds like, I'm just looking for a life coach. They're called pastors. If I hear one more person bring up a life coach, I'm going to light myself on fire. They're called pastors. It's called, I just intermittent fasting, it's called fasting. I'm trying to maximize. If I hear the word maximize one more time in 2024, I'm going to let myself on fire. I'm just, I'm just intermittent fasting. It's called fasting. Because intermittent fasting is about losing weight. Fasting is about losing your flesh. Not the same. It's called self-care. No, it's called Sabbath. Like, this is not new. We've been doing this stuff for a couple thousand years, but the world just wants to rename God's stuff and just take his name out of it and act like self-care is creative. It's called Sabbath. Find your mindfulness. It's called meditation and prayer. So today I want to talk about 
just real simply, and we're going to get into some stuff. Just prepare yourself. Buckle up. The amount of people after the last service, like, can you warn us next time? I'm like, no, it's not as fun. Um, here's two things that happen. Two things that happen when you lean into contemplation, mindfulness, prayer. When you lean into silence and solitude, there's two things. There's many things that will happen, but for sure these two things, and I would submit the most important two things that will happen. Number one, this is what will happen when you lean into a community of contemplation. Number one is you encounter, we, we encounter ourselves. We encounter ourselves. I think that study is so fascinating, not just from a psychological and um, psychology standpoint, from a spiritual standpoint. 67% of people would rather be shocked than talk to themselves. Why? Because I think we're scared of what's going to come up. I think we're scared of being alone. That's why you listen to music at all times. That's why you go to bed with the TV on. It's not because you have ADHD. It's because you uh, don't want to be alone. Not just relationally alone, alone with you. Why? Because we're scared what's going to come up. We're scared what's going to happen. We don't want to be alone with ourselves. Why? Because this is the reality. This is the reality. When your outer world gets quiet, your inner world gets loud. And that's why we would prefer to keep our outer world so loud so our inner world gets drowned out. Because we know when the TV goes off, when we put the phone away, when we turn the music off, we kick our friends out, and we sit in silence and solitude or contemplation, your soul begins to come. Your soul begins to come alive, and we're scared on what it's going to say. And the first thing, and maybe one of the most important things that happen when you commit to a life of contemplation, not just community, is we encounter ourselves. Now, this is not good preaching, but I'm going to divide the room. Preaching, communication, public orator, number one, you know, divide the room. But let's just do it for fun. Where are all of my extroverts at? Yeah, yeah. Where are all the introverts at? Some of you are so introverted, you don't want to lift your hand. <laughs> because then the other introvert will see you as an introvert, and they'll think you want to be friends, but you don't want to be friends because you're an introvert. <laughs> so you just don't want to tell anyone. You're like, we called them now in 2024 extrovert and introvert. 100 years ago, they were called people of community and people of contemplation. Introverts, extroverts. The reality is, let's divide the room in half. There are introverts in the room, and there are extroverts in the room. And I know some of you are already mad at me. Like, I'm perfectly both. We get it, you're Jesus, but okay. So for the rest of us, we know you're the perfect introvert and extrovert. We get it. But for the rest of us that lean one way, way more than the other, I want to talk to those two groups of people individually for a moment, and then we're going to come back together as one big dysfunctional family. But for a moment, all my extroverts, let me talk to you for a second. I am one. Shut up, you know, all right? Like, I'm an extrovert. And when I was a kid, my parents didn't have to spank me. Just put me in a room by myself, and that's punishment enough. I don't want to spend time alone. I'm an extrovert for extroverts. Like, I, I'm a lot, and I, I am, I'm an extreme extrovert. So let me just talk to all the extroverts for a moment. We ask you a question. Introverts, prepare yourself. We'll get, we'll get to you in a moment. Extroverts, let me ask you a question. Are we using community to hide from ourselves? This is what happens. Extrovert people are like, I just love people. I just love everyone. I can't be alone. I love the party, going to this party, that room, that friend, this dinner, that lunch, that coffee. I'm just a people person. I'm just an extrovert. Or are you just hiding from yourself and using community to do so? Extroverts got real quiet. How do you know? Because I do it all the time. <laughs> so I wonder for many of the extroverts in the room today, this is the reality. It's not just that you're extroverted, it's that you're scared. And so we hijack rooms. We hijack relationships. We hijack large gatherings because we would rather hide in big rooms than spend time one-on-one -on -one actually with someone else talking about our soul. That's too intimate. That's too much. So we actually aren't just extroverted. We're actually using gatherings and friends and birthday parties and coffees actually uh, in, a, in a disposable way to not just be with people, but to hide from ourselves. Look what Bonhoeffer says. Many people seek fellowship because they're afraid of being alone. 
The person who comes into fellowship because he's running away from himself is misusing it for the sake of diversion. And no matter how spiritual this diversion may appear, he is really not seeking community. Let him who cannot be alone be, oh, beware of community. He will only do harm to himself and to the community. All my extrovert friends, are we really extroverted? Are we really community driven? Are we really people oriented? Are we just scared to talk to ourselves? Because we're scared when we get quiet, what's gonna come up? And this is usually the thing about extroverts. Introverts think extroverts don't feel. Yeah, introverts, we know you. <laughs> introverts think extroverts hide their emotions, they don't feel them. They just, they, the reality is most extroverts, we feel so deeply and we're uncomfortable with them, so we hide them. It's not that extroverts don't feel it. I think for many extroverts, they just feel so deeply, but we don't know what to do with those emotions. So we hide in crowds, we hide in people, we hide in rooms. This is what extroverts usually think. We never say this out loud. Extroverts would never say this out loud. I'll just say it on the behalf of our group. <laughs> but we look at introverts, and we look at people that need silence. I just need a day off. There's too many people, work and life and friends. You're like, what are you? Friends are the best. <laughs> Busyness is a gift of God. Like, why are you skipping the party? I just need to have a day to myself. And this is what some, some extroverts, not this extrovert, <laughs> other extroverts think. They're just weak. Like, they just need a day off. They just can't handle the hustle and the bustle and the people and the work and the thing. They just need a day off to recover. And we can start thinking subconsciously even that weak people need solitude. That weak people need to recover. So you think Jesus is weak? So you think Jesus is a weak person? Because when you study the life of Jesus, every single major moment in his life, he spent time alone. Before the cross, he spent time in the garden by himself. Before picking the 12 disciples, he prayed all night alone on the hill. Before the Sermon on the Mount, he spent an entire day alone with God. Every moment before the cross, before his ministry started, he spent 40 days in the wilderness. Before every major moment in the life of Jesus, he spent it in solitude. I want you to write this down, especially the extroverts. Solitude is not a place where weak people go to hide. It's where disciples go to get stronger. Solitude, contemplation, is not a place where weak people go to hide. It's a place where disciples are supposed to go to get stronger. Extroverts, what is our relationship to ourselves? And are we hiding behind our extrovertness, but the reality is we just don't want to talk to ourselves? Okay, pause. Introverts, your turn. Extroverts, we're done. Good job. <laughs> introverts, now all the introverts in the room are like, this sermon is awesome. <laughs> yes, time alone. Silence, solitude, this sounds like something I can get behind. Leave me alone, don't talk to me, give me time with myself. Yes, pastor, I've been waiting forever for you to tell the, introvert, the extroverts to leave me alone <laughs> so I can be introverted. And this is how we relate to God and talk to God. Yes, finally, hear me, time to scroll, time to paint, time to binge watch trash TV. Time to catch up on the show. Time to get ready for emails. Time to get ready for work on Monday. Thank you, Pastor, for the excuse to be introverted. Hear me, you introverts. Having me time is not the same as solitude. Come on, introverts. Having me time is not the same thing as having solitude. Because hear me, self-care is about relaxing. Solitude is about renewing. So introverts are like, I do this all the time. No, 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 having me time, having scroll time, reading the book and catching up on the magazine is not the same as solitude. Self-care is about relaxing, but solitude is about renewing. Please write this down. Isolation is different than solitude. And I wonder how many introverts have been lying to yourself this whole time that you think you're a person of solitude, but in reality, you're a person of, of, of isolation. Look at this. Isolation is running from something. Solitude is running to something. 
Isolation is when you want to withdraw and get lost in your phone and get lost in the Netflix show and get lost in the novel and get lost in your new painting or get lost in the backyard or get lost in whatever. That's not the same thing as solitude. That's self-care, that's relaxation, that's me time. But that's not the same thing as solitude. The Bible does not say in Luke chapter 5, verse 16, and Jesus withdrew to catch up on work. And Jesus withdrew to have some me time. And Jesus withdrew to scroll. It says Jesus withdrew to pray. Let me ask all the introverts in the room, what are you withdrawing for? And where are you withdrawing to? Because this is the thing, introverts, that we'll come back together in a moment. Introverts do the same thing that extroverts do. Extroverts hide behind people. Introverts just hide behind a book. You hide behind a painting. You hide behind emails. The funny thing is, though introverts and extroverts are very different people, for many of us, we're all doing the same thing. We just do it in different ways. I hide behind a crowd, but you hide behind a painting. And what are we doing? Every one of us, more often than not, we're hiding from ourselves. The first thing, the most important thing that happens in the beginning when you begin to lean into contemplation and silence and solitude and retreating, withdrawing, is you encounter yourself. But this is the, this is the reality. Keep going. What am I saying? Solitude is examination. Solitude is examination. What are you supposed to do when you withdraw and have moments of solitude and silence and contemplation? You're supposed to examine. I did all the research for you. Don't worry about it. I looked up every single time in the whole Bible that the word test or examine is used. Specifically around yourself, not just like test the water or test the food. Like testing yourself. Here's the five things that the Bible tells us that we're supposed to examine. I'm going to lay this at your feet and invite you to do this this week. Number one, we're called to, there's a little pie chart. Number one, we're called to examine our work. And I don't mean your job. Somebody, I ain't examining that. I hate my job. I don't mean examine your job. Your work, I, what it, the Bible means is, what are you producing? What are you creating? What are you making? Your work, your hand. Your, what, are you, what are you plowing? What are you making? What are you doing? Galatians 6.4 says, let every, every man, let every, every individual test their work. Examine their work. Have moments of contemplation to examine, what am I producing? What am I making? What is my hand doing? What's happening? Number two, go quick. We're called to examine our faith. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. And test yourself. Wait a minute. To examine if I'm in the faith? Yeah, apparently you're supposed to have times and moments in your life going, am I really living what I'm claiming? Am I really acting like the bio that I have on Instagram? Am I really in the faith? Am I really walking this thing out? It's not a psychological, like, oh, I made a mistake. Am I still in the faith? That's not what I'm saying. I'm screwed up last night. Am I out of the faith? That's not what I'm saying. But there's supposed to be moments in contemplation that you can ask yourself and examine yourself. Am I really living this thing out? We're called to examine our faith. Number three, we're called to examine our soul. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight 28 says a person ought to examine themselves. That word it's themselves is the, their soul. They're inside. They're inner being, before they eat the bread and drink of the cup. But, so he's saying, like, before you take communion, you should like, check your soul. Where am I at? Where's my soul? Remind me where your emotions, your soul. Check your work, examine your work, examine your faith, examine your soul. Number four, examine your life. Your life is like your ways, your decisions, your world, your relationships, your life. Look at Lem- Lamentations verse 3, verse 40. Let us examine our ways, our life our decisions, and test them, examine them. Number five, the last thing that the Bible tells us to examine is words. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them, examine them. You know one of the most important things you're supposed to do in silence and solitude and contemplation is think about the words that have been spoken over you. Think about the words you've spoken over yourself. This is just simply, go back to the pie chart, this is simply five things that the Bible says that we're called to examine. How's my work, my hand, my production, how's my soul? 
How's my life, my decisions, my relationships? How's my faith? Am I living how God wants me to live? What words have been spoken over me? Hey, you can take a picture of that pie chart. You can write it down, whatever. I challenge you this week. Withdraw. Silence and solitude. Contemplation. Take a big, deep breath and encounter yourself. Not hide from ourselves, not hide from our soul, not hide from our inner world, but encounter it. Because this, this is the reality. Unknown pain is causing known damage. Unknown pain is causing known damage. Sounds like this. My husband is so frustrating. He is so annoying. I can't stand him. He does this and this and this, and I can't believe uh, he acts this way. He triggers me. I just can't stand this. This is so dysfunctional. And you're like going off on your husband. And then you like go to some time of solitude and prayer and contemplation. You begin to examine your life and your soul and your, and your world. And then you realize that you never forgave your father how he raised you and treated you. And you are simply misdirecting your anger to your husband. And then you come to realize it's not that your husband frustrates you. It's that you have undealt with pain that you are simply passing on to someone else that doesn't deserve it. Because unprocessed pain is doing known damage. This is what happens. You run into a person that does contemplation all the time. They're very in tune with themselves and their soul and their spirit and the relationship with God. And they ask you very deep questions, and this is what happens. When you don't talk intimately to yourself, it's weird when someone else does. When you don't talk intimately to yourself, it's weird when someone else does to you. I'll further this. When you don't listen to yourself, no wonder you don't listen to others. No wonder you have a hard time in conversations and you can't listen to anyone without being ready to speak because you don't listen to yourself. Why? Because the better we are at solitude individually, the better we are together in community. So number one, still on point number one, what happens when you lean into contemplation? Number one, you encounter yourself, which stats would say we are greatly scared of. Number two, furthermore, what happens when you lean into contemplation is you encounter God. Not just yourself, God. And this is where I want to park for some time. That's why Psalms 46, 10 says, be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I'm God. Because for many of us, we're so busy, we're so active, we're so slammed at work and life and kids, and I get it, I have three kids. My son has three games today, I had two games yesterday. Like, life is busy, kids are, bu- like, work, li- I get it. But we can start doing is we, we can become so busy with life that we start compartmentalizing God and we start not interacting with him the way that we should and that's why Psalms 46 10 says be still and know that I'm God and this is some things I want to talk about today I've been waiting a long time to say or just been road telling in my own heart is what we can do is we can it will be on the screen we can use the people of God to run from the person of God And it's why some people want to serve all day long. It's not because they're humble, it's because they're avoiding. Because we, I'll just serve, I'll just serve, I'll just serve. We serve all day. Why? Because we know if we come in this room and actually sit down, slow down, God will begin to speak. And we don't know what he's going to say. So we serve our way. And we look like we're humble. We look like we're for the house. And we look like we're such a serving Serve a hood person, but in reality, we're just avoiding God. And we can use the people of God to avoid the person of God. Because this is, this is the reality. 
for some of us that do talk to ourselves and we do, we do um, encounter ourselves, this is, this is the reality. We know what's in there. And we're scared for God to see it. As if he doesn't know. My favorite author, I named my son after him. St. Augustine says this. You should hear these words. My heart is listening, Lord. Open the ears of my heart. The house of my soul is too small for you to enter. Make it more spacious by your coming. It lies in ruins. Rebuild it. Look at this. Hey, um, some things are to be found there which will offend your gaze. I confess this to be so. I do not argue my case against you, for you are truth itself, nor do I wish to deceive myself. But if you, Lord, kept the score of iniquities, who could bear it? But this I know, that I was welcomed by the tender care of your mercy. Do you see what he's saying? Lord, I, I want to invite you in, but just a warning, God, you're going to find some things in here that offends you. And I know it. I don't want to lie to you or myself. My soul is too small for you. Make it larger by your coming. And Lord, I know. I know that if you kept all the records of iniquities, who could bear it? But I'm thankful that I was welcomed by your tender mercy. What happens when you lean in? Silence and solitude, you encounter God. Many things that happen when you encounter God, but this is what I want to say. Deeply prophetic, I want to say this today. I've been, I've been wrestling with this and toiling in my soul for a while. I want to say some things today that I think many of you need to hear. What happens when you encounter God? Many things, of course, but here's the main thing. We have our identity realigned and reinforced. We are reminded who we are and whose we are. What happens when you retreat? What happens when you withdraw? What happens when you lean into contemplation, silence, and solitude? You encounter yourself for sure, but more than that, you encounter God. And one of the main things that happens when you encounter God is your identity is realigned. It's reinforced. And we are reminded who we are and whose we are. Because this is what happens. Oh, I need you to hear this. Because if you don't know who you are in God, you'll seek it from the community and they won't give it. Oh, I'm going to preach. <laughs> Look at what Henry Nouwen says. I want you to hear, if I, just please hear these words. Henry Nouwen says, you have to listen to the voice who calls you beloved. Because otherwise you will run around begging for affirmation. For praise and for success. And then you're not free. Why is it so important that solitude comes before community? Because if we do not know who we are, the beloved sons and daughters of God, we're going to expect someone in the community to make us feel that way, and they cannot. <laughs> Write this down. This is good. This is worth the price of admission. You're like, we paid for this? No. <laughs> but when you, when you get what you need from God, now you come to community in a state of confidence, not insecurity. When you get what you need from God in your devotions, your prayer, your Bible, your reading, your solitude, your contemplation, now I'm coming to connect group, not needy, but full. Now I'm not coming to church insecure, I'm coming confident. Because you can't say the word over me that I need to hear, only God and God alone can say the word over me that I need to hear. Come on, we're all grown adults in this room. We become needy and clingy and controlling. Did you like my song? You didn't like my post. You didn't share my thing. You didn't say you liked my outfit. Did you like my new hair? And we are chasing, what are we doing? Abusing community, asking them to give you something only God can give you. And now we're running around a bunch of insecure children 
do you like this? Do you like that? Is this okay? Are we good? Do you like my hair? You didn't share my post. You didn't buy my thing. You didn't say. Only one voice can call you beloved. Only one voice can call you son and daughter. And it's not your connect leader. It's not your friends you serve with. It sure ain't me. It'd be weird if I start calling you my beloved. <laughs> That's when Julia puts me six feet under. But, like, I wonder how, just consider how different church connect groups and serving would be if you showed up complete. Not insecure. Not needy. Not clingy. Not striving for affirmation. It's, I know who I am and whose I am. And if I already spent time with my God that is realigned and reaffirmed and reinforced my identity, hear me, now I can show up to community giving, not always needing. And then, I'm staying like this because it's super important. <laughs> then I can actually enjoy your presence because I don't need something from you. Now I can just enjoy you. But if you don't ever spend time with yourself or with God, no wonder you're running from connect group to connect, to connect group. No wonder you're running from serve team to serve team because you won't withdraw. You won't spend time in contemplation to figure out who you are and whose you are. Yeah, we're called to be people of community, gatherings and rooms, and I'm, I'm an extrovert, massive one. When one person texts me and says, we can't hang out, I have a list of 30 others. <laughs> Introverts are like, thank God. <laughs> I don't want to see you anyway. I'm like, oh, you're busy, I'll find someone else. Like, I, I'm a crowd person, I'm a community person. But I've learned over years, this is what I'm preaching today, I've learned, I've grown, that if I don't learn how to spend time alone, I'm actually hurting my community, not helping. Because I show up needy. I show up wanting. Yes, we're called to be people of community, gatherings, friendship, tables, for sure. But we're also called to be people of contemplation. And I would submit, I think I said it before, Bill will be on the screen again. The better we are individually with solitude, the better we are together in community. The better we are individually in silence and solitude and contemplation, the better we are in community together. Luke 5, 16 says, Jesus withdrew often. Because contemplation should drive me to community. And community should drive me to contemplation. Yeah. I'm tired of being alone. Where's my friends? I'm sick of you. I want some time alone. <laughs> I need some people. And where's my friends? That's enough. I'll go back. <laughs> it's supposed to be this rhythm of people drive me to God and God drives me to people. Yeah. Yeah. God drives me to people and people send me right back to God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this was fun. I'll be back. <laughs> but notice, God will never send you to isolation. Yes. Yes. God will always drive you back to your family and your family will drive you back to God. And we are supposed to be in this rhythm yeah. of community and contemplation. Contemplation and community. And the better we get at both, the better we get for each other and we become healthy. And now I can't wait to see you instead of avoiding you. And now I can't wait to be with myself instead of avoiding myself. Because I know if I'm good here, I'll be better here. And if I can be good here, that's going to drive me here. And then we become amazingly healthy, fully devoted followers of Jesus that are so for community and so for contemplation.
And today I'm inviting many of you, introverts and extroverts alike, to stop hiding. Come encounter yourself and come encounter God. It's going to be a lot scary, all those things. But when you get used to this and you begin, your soul becomes healthy, watch what kind of community we could create. It'd be amazing. I know the last three weeks I've been like easy, like, oh, like, yeah, and amen, like, sure, like, yeah, I get the last three weeks are very hard. Last week, like, living in a community of confession is not simple. It's very difficult. And living in a community of contemplation is not just like, yay and amen, it's super simple. It's very difficult to find rhythms. But we're not allowed to choose one or the other. We are people of both.